The life at Porto Ferraro was lively enough. There were the soldiers of the battalion whose barracks were near the palace, the workmen who worked here and there, people coming and going, some strangers landing every day. On Sundays, everybody, civil or military, wore his best clothes. There was a mass at the Emperor's Palace. It was said in the little waiting room by the archpriest, the curate of Porto Ferraro, a sort of bishop, I suppose, as he was dressed in violet. He was a Corsican of the old stock and some sort of relation to the emperor. Those who served the mass were Abbe Bonavita and a young priest. The Grand Marshal, General Drouot, and General Cambron were to the right and left, and a little behind the emperor. The officers of the guard and the principal functionaries were behind and took places as they could, as the room was small. The greater part remained outside. At the end of the mass, there was a reception in the salon. All the military were in full uniform. Madame Mare had said mass at her house. Monsieur Bonavita was her chaplain. As for the Princess Pauline, she always found some way to escape being at divine service. On that day, the emperor always had a grand dinner. That is to say, a few more people than usual. Madame Mare was usually there. General Giroux, two or three officers of the guard, and two or three others. The emperor had one day in the week when he went to dine with his mother. The dishes served were cooked in the Italian manner. They recalled to him the meals which he used to take in his father's house. Her Highness's Major Dorma was a Corsican near Cipriani who died at St. Helena. He enjoyed the confidence of the emperor and all the other members of the imperial family. He was often entrusted with important missions. After he got out, out of bed in the morning. The emperor used to take a cup of chicken broth and afterwards a small glass of Constance wine as the broth was very good. And the quantity that they sent from the kitchen was much more than the emperor needed. The valets de chambre would take it when the emperor had gone into his study. And like their master, they would each drink a cup of Constance. They thought that what the emperor liked, they also ought not to dislike. It prepared their stomachs to receive their breakfasts. The emperor was accompanied on his rides, either on horseback or in a carriage by an escort of four or five men, poles or mamelukes, under the charge of Monsieur Rule of a chef sir never us or me and of Alan drew his vicar the rides took place in the cool of the morning up to nine or ten o'clock at three or four in the afternoon when the sun began to lose its strength the emperor would go either on foot or in his carriage to take his boat and row about the vast basin of the roadstead stopping sometimes on one side sometimes on the other to visit people who live near the shore the carriage was often ordered to go and wait for him at such and such a spot the boat was manned by sailors of the guard one who had been a boatman to princess elisa held the tiller princess pauline went about a sedan chair she was accompanied by her ladies in waiting and one or two officers as for madame mare i do not recollect that she went out much except to see the emperor madame mare must have been a beauty in the first rank in her youth her face was well modeled with regular features her mouth is neither too large nor too small her lips are thin her nose almost straight her eyes brown large brilliant very expressive there was always some haughtiness and severity in her look but the beauty of her features lost part of its effect because of the thick layer of paint which she put on her cheeks. This did not harmonize with her age, which required greater naturalness in the color of her skin. Too much rouge does not go well with wrinkles. In ordinary weekdays, her dress was simple, though rich. She ordinarily wore a little bonnet ornamented with flowers. On Sundays and holidays, when she was in full dress to come to the palace, she had on a toque with feathers. On these occasions, she wore very fine diamonds. I knew nothing about her her household arrangements. I know that she was very religious. It was said to be very miserly. When she spoke French, she had a very marked Italian accent. She said very little. At Paris, her place of table was on His Majesty's right. At Elba, she sat opposite him. Princess Pauline might have been from 30 to 35 years old when she was at Elba. Her person, from what could be seen, had all the beautiful proportions of the Venus of Medici. Nothing was lacking to her, but a little youth, for the skin of her face was beginning to be wrinkled, but a few defects which resulted from age disappeared under the slight coating of cosmetic, which gave more animation to her pretty features. Her eyes were charming and very lively. Her teeth were admirable. 
and her hands and feet were of the most perfect model. She always dressed most carefully and in the style of a young girl of 18. She always said that she was ill at a source when she had to go up and down stairs. She had herself carried on a square of red velvet having a stick with handles on each side and yet if she wasn't a ball she danced like a woman who enjoys very good health. She dined with the emperor and he liked to tease and poke fun at her. One evening she was so angry with what the emperor had said to her that she rose from table and went away with tears in her eyes. The irritation did not last long for the emperor went up to see her that evening or the next morning the little feeling of annoyance quickly disappeared. The emperor went to St. Merton nearly every morning. This was his country house. It was situated in a long valley facing the city and distant from it. About half a league. It was built at the end of the valley and halfway up the hill on the side looking towards the town. There were two stories and on the other side the upper story was on a level with the ground. Before this facade, there was a sort of court, and on the other side was a terrace. Although the house was ordinary enough to look at, it was very well arranged. There was a large dining room open on the court, and a drawing room of the same size, which looked out on the valley. These two rooms occupied the middle of the house and were each lighted by three windows. Five very little rooms transformed into a bedroom of study to see and the entry made up the whole house it was all very clean but extremely simple and modest in its decoration and furnishing i recollect that the sofas and other furniture of the sort were stuffed with hay instead of hair and the material which covered them was green cloth the walls of the drawing room were decorated with views of temples and other buildings of upper egypt i seem to have seen on a chest of drawers in the dining room a marble bust of the emperor his mother at the two ends of the building outside there were two flights of steps which went down to the terrace at the bottom of that on the very right was a door which opened into a very pretty bathroom it was decorated with egyptian views one would have thought himself in a panorama all around one were the pyramids the sphinx obelisks temples etc the painter who had the decoration of this room had arranged everything with much taste the spectator was in the middle of a square room with Egyptian pillars. All the models had been taken from the great works of Egypt. The bathtub, which was of white marble, was vase-shaped. The other rooms on the ground floor were for the kitchens, the pantries, etc.